I, um, I spent some time growing up in Ireland, and I was in the Army, so I tend to think military clock, clock a lot. Uh, so just be warned. Um, okay, we've already had this up for a long time. You know who I am, you know what I did, and all this stuff. This is, let's see if it works, 20 books to $1.50K, write, publish, market, a tour at warp speed. So looking at the math, we got 20 books to 50K. That means we want, oh, ha, this is going to be hard, 20 books and $50,000 a year, which when you roll the math means you're going to be doing about $2,500 per book per year, which ends up being $6.85 coming in from each title that you want to have. So it's sort of like hold that in your mind. Obviously, you know, some of your books are going to be making more money each day and some are going to be making less and there's a whole bunch of other stuff to add in, but it's kind of like that's your bookmark. Uh, if you're selling ebooks and you're selling them on Amazon for, you know, say $2.99, you're going to make about $2.10, which means on that title, you're going to have to sell over three books a day to make it work. Anyway, so getting to 20, how do we get to 20 books? Here's more math. Um, if your book target size is 90,000 words, 90K, and you write 1,000 words a day, uh, then you'll need 90 days to write one book, okay? Which means you can write four books a year, more or less. Which means that it's going to take you five years to get your 20 books written. That's a realistic number. Uh, you're not going to be, you know, you won't have to push yourself harder or faster. You can do it. Um, books that are going to help you move along in this, I would recommend checking out. There's a lot of them out there, and you've probably seen more. But certainly, my launch plan sucks. Help, my launch plan sucks by Mal Cooper and Jill Cooper. And also, release strategies by Craig Martell. And there'll be a lot more. And Oh, it's not me making the squeaky noise. It's the door. I was thinking, oh my god, how did I do that? Um, anyway, those are some, some books to consider. All righty, so a long time ago, Robert Heinlein published Heinlein's Rules for Writers. I have revised it to make it Indies Rules for Author. Notice the Indie hat. Um, so write it. Uh, do your word links. You know, typically we're looking between 80 and 100,000 words, uh, but a novel is actually 40,000 words or more. So you can do that too. You can write short. It means you're going to want to write more than 20 to, to hit your money goal. Um, I advise that you track your productivity. I do a thing where at the end of every day, I look at my word count and I have a nice spreadsheet that subtracts it from the day before so I can find out how many words I wrote that day. I sometimes skip days. So I have one count that is actually the average from day one to day whatever it is. I have another count that is the average from the days that I've been writing. So it may end up that it looks like I'm writing 2,000 words day average, but it was actually when I'm working, I'm getting three or 4,000 words. That's just me. Um, everybody, your mileage will vary. Um, but part of the reason I'm here speaking today is to give you what I call the throw darts at example. It's like, oh, I can do better than that. I want to do it this way. But at least you have something that you can look at. Uh, finish it. Edit it. Uh, also, if you want, find an editor and learn the difference between a copy editor, a line editor, and a creative editor. For your own self, and even when you're working with an editor, I highly recommend uh, checking out Self-Editing for Fiction Writers by Rennie Brown and Dave King. I've been using it for zonks. When do you get along around? I've been writing since 1985. Um, it's like your mistakes go down. Doesn't mean you don't make mistakes, but they go down and you get a little bit better. A lot of people like the pro writing aid. Uh, I give a caveat. It's geared towards business letters as far as I can see. And it has a tendency to, com to um, encourage homogeneity. Uh, your voice is your voice. So it's, you don't want to have it diluted too much or you're going to be writing something anybody else could write. And that's not what you want to do. Publish it. Select your markets. Draft to digital will give you a broad range. Amazon, Kindle Direct will give you a smaller range. Uh, and you want to look at that. But remember, you can always play around. 
If you're doing a bunch of series, say you've got one series and another series, you can say, I'm going to try this one with draft to digital, see how it goes. I'm going to try this one with what we call narrow, Kindle Select, Kindle University, and, and KDP. Um, and that'll, you know, play. You're going to learn. This is all about making mistakes and learning and getting better. And next year, I'll be asking you how you did it so that I'll learn. Um, format it. We have today for, for Mac, we have Vellum. We also have newly launched Atticus. Uh, I, there's a long story behind the sins I committed to be working with Adobe InDesign. Uh, Adobe InDesign is incredibly powerful, but it's got a real steep learning curve. On the other hand, Google is so cool nowadays, you can pretty much ask any question, how do I do this in InDesign? And you'll get an answer or a whole bunch of them. Cover it, that means put a cover on it. Let's see if I can find the covers. Where'd you go? Okay, they're gone. No, wait a minute. They're gone. Rats. I'll have to look for them. I thought I'd cat packed it in one of my two slots, but I have not. Um, I tend to. A lot of how many people here read ebooks? Okay, how many people here read books? The same number. Okay, um, a lot of people when they're just going with ebooks, they tend to think in terms of the ebook front cover. I grew up, you know, with Anne McCaffrey as a mother. I grew up looking at what we call cover flats, which are the whole thing of a book that would end up being glued on and wrapped around. So I think the full cover flap, flat, sorry. Um, and it's the door again. <laughs> sorry. That gets useful for me for a lot of reasons. Um, so I am at the point right now where I'm designing a lot of my own covers, lucky me. Um, and when you get a cover, I advise you to consider going for a full wraparound cover. You can slice pieces out. Make that be your, uh, your front cover for uh, Kindle. Works fine. Um, but you've got you to put a cover on it. And the thing to remember about covers, guys, the thing that I forgot, didn't like, didn't want to believe, a cover is a marketing tool. It is not your story, it is not your novel, it is not anything else. Its purpose is to get you to go look at that book. You know, if you're in a bookstore, to pick it up and go, wow, what's that about? If you're on Amazon, to click on either the book, the inside book, or download a sample. But it's a marketing tool. Uh, it was, for me, incredibly easy to get stuck in there. But it doesn't look like in the character. No, you just want people to pick it up. It should give clues of genre, you know? If you're trying to sell a cozy romance, a chainsaw with blood dripping from it, probably not a good idea, right? Um, you know, broken hearts you might get away with. Keep the chainsaw off the cover. Anyway, so you want to cover it. You want to, we call it blurb it. And blurb means a whole bunch, it covers a whole bunch of sins. Blurb is the description on the back. Blurb ends up being a lot of the product description we put up on Amazon. Uh, it is m fundamentally... It's when you pick up the book and you turn it over, what you read that makes you go, okay, well, here's my money. Um, I just recently read a really cool book by a lady named Theodora Taylor, uh, who writes black romance, but I don't care, because she wrote this book called Universal Fantasies. Uh, now, for me, that's not maybe that the, the words I would choose, because she later on she says, when, when you watch Julia Child, everybody remember Julia Child, the cook, and she talks about adding more butter? I'm kind of thinking really what she's hitting is butter. Um, this makes it richer and tastier, and it's the parts of the book that we, we, we remember. Because um, I got the example at the top of my head. How many people here have read Dragonflight? Uh, okay, enough. So um, there are some scenes in Dragonflight that just pull tears right out of your eyes and stuff. Those are usually butter or universal fantasy themes. Uh, with, with Dragonflight and with Harry Potter, we have uh, sort of a rags to riches. 
thing going on. That's a, that's a universal fantasy. You get universal fantasies. If you, if you remember Grey's Anatomy, well, that's full of it. You know, Peyton Place, it's a, it's a drama. It's she's dating her boss. Oh, my God. So universal fantasies. When I think the word fantasy, I think, you know, Gandalf and Lord of the Rings. But she means the sort of stuff that we're all... There, it's in us. We know this. We know we like the idea of love at first sight, happily ever after. So when you write a blurb, consider, I highly recommend, uh, writing something that actually looks at the, these universal fantasies, these emotional pulls. We tend as writers, we want to say, well, but it's about this and it's about that. Um, and we end up doing a synopsis or something, and that's not really what's going to pull people in. They want to know really the heart, the emotions that they're going to run through in this story. So that's your blurb, and it's a huge section. You hopefully have been looking at all sorts of people like Brian Cohen, Brian Meeks. Yeah, I don't know why Brian's are so good at writing blurbs, but that's it. That's what it is. Um, and you, you want to do that. Then, of course, step four, the, the very easy step that everybody has no problem doing, market it, advertise it, and then the final step, repeat until rich. Very important, that step. Okay, there are a lot of people in the universe who go one way and another way on this. I say that it is much easier to write what you love. Um, books are transformations. When you come out at the end of a book, you're different. As a writer, when you come out at the end of the book, you're really different. You know, if you killed off that favorite character that everybody's going to, you know, that you love, and you're rolling tears down your face and everything, that's going to come over to the reader. Uh, so it's a hard thing because we're worried about, with, with, with the craft of writing, we have the art, the love part of what we write, and we also have the cold, hard cash business part. But the reality is pretty much everywhere you go, you have that. Learning to break them up and make them work together is a, is a trick that you'll have to develop yourself along the time, along the way. Um, but more and more I've gotten to the point that I write what I love. And if people want to read it, yay, I get rich. And if people don't want to read it, I write another book. Um, you know, Stephen King says, write first for yourself and revise for your readers. And I think that's a really good way to look at it. First draft, if you can. How many people have that evil editor in their head? The, the one that says, no, that sentence isn't right. The one that says, how dare you write anything? You're not as good as fill in the blank. Yeah, OK, we all have that editor. And the, the nicest thing you can do with that editor while you're writing is chloroform it, uh, you know? <laughs> Or learn at least the gentle art of saying, I hear you, I understand what you're saying, but allow me to be wrong. Because you can fix things when the words are there to fix. You know, when it's a blank screen, it's really hard to do anything. Uh, so it's very important, I think, to just let yourself go. Uh, I did an exercise with people at one point where I said, okay, and you may want to try this exercise, write the world's worst opening paragraph. Seriously, I mean, take, take it up as an idea. Yeah, write the world's worst opening paragraph. You're not allowed to cheat. You can't do lists or, you know, bad typos or run on sentences. You have to, like, you know, it was a dark and stormy night. Suddenly, you know, a shot was fired, da, 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 da. Okay, so the first thing I do with that when I, when I ask people to look at this is then I say, we're going to learn a little bit about critiquing. Now, you've written a paragraph that you know is terrible, so what somebody says about it really shouldn't hurt your feelings too much. Uh, so, you know, and then I say, who's, who's brave enough to stand up and read something? It's amazing how many people still sit down. But they read it, and we talk about how you can give feedback, you know. We all know that paragraph is terrible. It was written to be terrible, so it's not hard to give feedback to say, this paragraph didn't work for me because. And that's... You know, that's cool and fair enough, and that's how you want to do that. Then the final little trick I put into this little exercise is I say, okay, and now you may add up to one sentence. Could be a fragment, could be a full sentence, anywhere in that paragraph to make it better. And everybody is like, whoa, because it gets, it's real easy. And so that's a lesson in how easy it is to fix something in editing. All right. Okay, so how do you write what you love? Okay, you're going to get this from everybody. Start with a good sentence. Okay, this is a freebie sentence, by the way, and I love it. I haven't figured out where I'm going to go with it, but we kept the corpse. 
Uh, in the 93-page slide, I do something where I actually spend a little bit more time breaking this down and looking at what it implies. Because when we write, we also develop a reader contract. We'll see that in another slide, too. But we, we promise the reader some level of what they're going to get out of this story. Uh, you know, with a blaze of whining sound, the chainsaw descended through. Okay, so uh, hands up. Is that a horror? Okay, you think it's a horror? Okay, how about it's something else? Could be, yeah. I mean, could could be a lot of things. So how about the next part of it? I mean, the, the, the chainsaw whipped through the bones and cut the thing to shards. Now we know it's something else. But what if it was the chainsaw went through the wood and lovingly removed the sections that weren't Michelangelo or something like that? We can go a number of ways. Uh, but our you know, we're, we're, you know, we set a reader expectation. This opening line, which I think is just like... The thing I love about this opening line is we kept the corpse. I think I got you hooked with that sentence. You know? What goes beyond that, I don't know. And honestly, it's one of those, if you take it and you write a story to it, um, be my guest. Have fun. You know? Also, you can write a story to it and decide that it's just an exercise. And again, so we kept the corpse. There's a couple things that came out of that. One, we know that we're past tense. We're not a present tense. Two, we know that we're probably looking at a first person talking about a group of people. Three, we want to know, why did they keep the corpse? What does this mean? Could be an Area 51, you know, the aliens there. Could be you're uh, a coroner and, and you've got to keep this corpse for evidence. We don't know. But I think that sentence is going to get you to read the next one. Uh, and then you want people to read the next sentence after that and finish the paragraph Finish the scene, finish the chapter, the book, and want more. If you're science fiction people, Robert A. Heinlein, particularly with his juveniles, was a master of this. Louis L'Amour in Westerns was a master of this. And this is what we want. We want them to finish the book and go, oh, how can I buy the next one, you know? Uh, so I just mentioned this a little bit. The reader contract. Your first sentence, or at the very least, your first paragraph, must set the tone and establish the reader contract. If you break it, it will cost. You may get away with it, but if somebody's expecting a happy ending and you give them a horrible ending and everybody dies, uh, you know, how often are, are they going to want to read more books from you? If you set up a horrible opening and everybody's expecting, you know, blood on the streets and you end up, you know, planting poppies or something, again, so, but we all know this. If you're reading a lot, you already know the reader contract. You've seen places where it's been broken. You're going, I don't want to read anything more by this guy. Reader contract is an informal deal that you, the writer, make with your readers. I'm reading this. Um, and you do this through tone, wording, and setting, like we kept the corpse or the buzz of the chainsaw. Um, so, and like I say, the readers want to know what they're getting into. Yay. This. Okay, so this ends up being part of a longer thing. I talk about books and instant coffee. Um, there's probably other ways to talk about it that are just as good. Uh, when you write, you have access to all of your memories, all of your emotions, thoughts, and dreams. They, they are your basis to start the story. This is your starting point. You know, you don't put it in the book, but it's there in you. So you create the book, and unfortunately, you, you sort of, you can't get all that in there, or you can try. But people, you know, the color, the word blue may mean very different things to different people. Um, you know, they, they may, uh, some people may hear the word blue and think, oh, depressed and sad. Other people may think blue, sky. You know, your, your own way of reading things back is going to be different. So what I like to say is your book is kind of like making freeze-dried instant coffee, right? The book itself is the, the instant coffee. And the original coffee, yeah, okay. Do I want, do you want, okay. It's like instant coffee. The original coffee was made with your brand of water. In the instant coffee, the water was freeze-dried out to create instant granules. The reader, in reading the book, adds their own water, their own background, to make a new cup of coffee. And this is why so many people have different reactions to the same words on paper, they're all using different water heated to a perfect, their own temperature. And because not everyone can get a decent cup from your freeze-dried ingredients, your book, not everyone will care for what you brew. But I think if you understand that, and it takes a while because 
every time somebody edits my book, it's like, you want to cut off the extra arm? How dare you? Um, you know, it's, it's our baby. It takes a while to move to the point where you can say, okay, I get it. Other people don't like the reading style. They don't want to go that way. They don't get, they have different water to add to the coffee. All righty. Uh, looking again, sort of looking at how we're going to get ourselves $50,000 a year with 20 books. Series are important. Writing a series of books can help build an audience. It allows you to explore and, and travel with characters. People fall in love with characters. They want to learn more about them. Examples include the Louis L'Amour Western Sackett series. Um, these are all from my favorite list, by the way. Patricia Briggs's Mercedes Thompson uh, Werewolf series. Lois McMaster Bujold's uh, science fictional Vorkosigan Sagan. David Weber's science fictional Honorverse and Jim Butcher's The Dresden Files, which was also a TV series. So there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff there, and we see that. And, oh, I guess I could throw in the Dragon Riders of Pern, but okay. Um, <laughs> but they're also a trap, and, and that's a good segue. Okay, because if readers don't like your first, or your second, or your third book, they'll drop your series. So you spend a lot of time, a lot of advertising, building this series, and they, it's, it's not for them, not the right cup of coffee. Also because a writer can sometimes find themselves encouraged to continue to write in one particular series and get stale. Um, there, it happens, you know, we all think about those big name authors. It, there's this whole thing when somebody says, I'll give you a million dollars if you write a sequel, and you don't. Well, we'll give you $50,000 for a new book. Okay, that's a huge economic drag. Uh, so it can get really, really tempting and really, really hard to say, I need a break or I'm done. And every writer who's made it big in this world has run into this. Um, okay, but you should also know that every single new book in that series will increase the sales of all the other books. They will just, people will come back, they'll go, you know, oh wow, and, and whatever. Um, so it is something, this is where it can be really cool. I tend to do both. Uh, in our world, being independents, I think the smart move is to try and work on a number of series, which may be, you know, write three books in whatever you love, write another three books in something else you love, maybe write books four, five, and six in the first you love. It's going to be up to you. Uh, but that certainly, I think, is, is where we get to find our mojo. That's the word. All righty. Okay, so now we've, we've written a book. We need to do that 20 more times, but we've written a book. What happens? We've got to edit it. We talked about that. Uh, as I say, first, bury it in soft peat. Those of you who know the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy will recognize that this is the part of the uh, paperwork you have to do to go ahead and retrieve your mother from uh, the, well, it's the, the infamous bug bladder beasts of Troll. Anyway, um, you want to put it aside. You want to you work on something else, not the sequel. The sequel will mean that you have to go back and look at it. Um, you want to get far enough away from the book that you finished that it's not your baby or that demon child. It, you, you want to be able to look at it a little bit like, okay, things can get better in this book or things are not so bad in this book. Um, you want to judge it fairly. And it, this, is, this is a skill that develops over time. You know, you will have a different reaction to the first book than you will to the 30th book. It's still, it can be harder and harder. I've found that I'm getting closer and closer to the point where I can finish a book and start editing it, do a reread. Um, everybody's going to be different, so your mileage will vary. Um, you need to, okay, and we're, going, we're going to the mechanics of the universe, but save a copy of the original. Uh, work with the copy. Keep the original aside, because you never know when the magic fingers fail you and all of a sudden you've discovered you've deleted every word you wrote of a 90,000 word. Yeah, don't do that. Um, I work with Google Docs. Google Docs is up in the cloud and so it's there in the cloud. I can collaborate and I can actually see my collaborator typing. Uh, there's what we in software world call version control. Um, so it means that I can go back and say, oh man, I, whatever I wrote today is really bad. I want to go back to yesterday. Uh, so that's one thing a lot of, you know, you can do it with other things. Uh, you can run a spell check. 
uh, or use pro, pro writing aid. I've already given my caution on pro writing aid that it, uh, one of the things that, that bothers me the most about pro writing aid is it tends to flag uh, passive voice. But as we all know, mistakes were made. You know, it's a passive voice thing, and it's much more powerful than me saying, I made some mistakes. In context, that might be the right sentence, I made some mistakes. Other, for other things, it's like, mistakes were made. We don't know, blah, 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 blah. So it can be, you know, you want to understand how passive voice can be a powerful thing for you. Um, you may want to get an outside editor. Most of you will. Uh, my first eight books were traditionally published, and I had not only a traditional editor, but I also had a Cefwa Nebula Grandmaster mother reading the books and an agent, so I got really edited. Um, when I went in, I had over a million words published. I've also edited two nonfiction books. Um, even so, when I published my first indie book, there were more than a few typos discovered. Um, so I went and got a professional editor to go over the book once more. There are still typos. There will always be typos. Um, how many people here understand standard deviation and two sigma, six sigma, all that stuff? Uh, OK, a couple of you. Um, basically, um, more. All right, so one sigma is, I believe, 69% of a population. Two sigma is like 95. And then three sigma is 99.7. And then you get all the way out to six sigma, which is kind of like it's perfect anyway. But if you take a book, for example, we'll just use simple numbers because my brain, uh, say you take, you wrote 100,000 words and you're within one sigma of um, errors. So that would mean that you have 100,000 minus 69,000, 31,000 errors. That's a lot. Uh, when you get down to three sigma, it's a lot less. But there's always errors. I was a software programmer for a long while and IBM said, Generally, for every thousand lines of software code, you had two errors. Um, so it's going to happen. Also, the, the cool rule, Murphy in action, when you first get your book in the most permanent form you can find it, you will open it to the page with the worst typo. <laughs> so those of you who've read The White Dragon will remember the scene when Jackson went off and found a clutch of fire lizard eggs. And you may wonder why, a number of pages later, Jackson went off and found a clutch of fire lizard eggs. Hey, typo. It had been gone through by my mother, me, my sister, uh, mom's agent, mom's editor, mom's pa uh, copy editor, you know, the page proofreaders. We all missed it. All of us. My mom was just a what? You're flagging numbers at me. Oh, good. I'll go faster. Um, <laughs> this is good. Um, but it happens. You know, it really drives you nuts. But we're in the age of Amazon. So when people send me typos, I fix it not only in the ebook, but actually in the print book. Now, your print book may have the typo, but the next print book won't. Anyway, um, so I've used a number of strategies since then to reduce typos and other errors. Uh, one of the most powerful strategies in large print, read your work out loud, uh, even if you're trying to get a feel for it, if you can. Now, 250,000 words read out loud, good luck. Uh, you know, 3,000 words read out loud can be done. You will find all sorts of stuff when you read it out loud. Uh, you'll find that, the, you know, the dialogue doesn't quite work. You'll find typos, a whole bunch of stuff. So it, it is a way. Um, it is probably more of a way to attune you to the sort of errors you make. I would not recommend it for The Lord of the Rings, for example. Probably a bit too big. Okay, so now we got it edited. We're good. Um, now we're talking about releasing this book to the wild world. So narrow or wide? Narrow is when you're going with KDP and KU, and you can now the thing with Kindle to understand is you can do an ebook, a paperback, and nowadays a hardback. Um, so you can, the people who want your book can forever can go buy a hardback. It's not hard to format them for all three. Wide means you're releasing on a whole bunch of platforms, including Apple and Kobo and Nook, just a whole bunch. Uh, and one of the ways that, that people have worked with is the draft to digital. Draft to digital uh, takes a 10% commission, which ain't so bad for all the work they do. Uh, they put it up there. They get it out there. They collect money. They send you money. It's a lot of work. 
if you want to go that way. I have tried both, and I will probably try both again. Right now, I'm narrow. I'm with Amazon and KU, and I found that's been working for me. But your mileage will vary. Alpha readers. Everybody know about alpha readers? Oh, you nod your heads. Good. So remember, you love these people. You are grateful for every nit they pick, even if you don't use it. Thank them and nurture them because these, you know, if you turn your alpha readers off and they don't want to read it anymore, who's going to do the alpha reading? Alpha reading is where you're, you got the first draft done, you've been through it. They're going to see things you didn't see because we're talking about coffee again. Uh, and that's really important. They'll say, hey, I don't understand how, how that worked. Or did you realize she was wearing red heels in this scene? And then two scenes later, she's wearing a Gucci bag and nothing else? I, you know, you, you love that stuff. Okay. You're ready, ready to release your book. After you absorb the feedback from your editors, send out your revised manuscripts to your alpha readers. You're reading. You're reading. Okay, typo. You're ready. <laughs> yeah, that's good. You're ready to get published. When the alpha readers finish their feedback and they've incorporated and you've incorporated their suggestions, you're ready for the next steps. Pre-orders and beta readers. Um, Pre-orders pre are really interesting. You can put your book on Amazon. People are telling me 90 days, but I think I've gone longer um, to say, hey, you can get this book in 90 days. Uh, it's been really interesting. The last book I put out through pre-order was Raw Space, and I had 104 pre-orders, which is nice. Um, the advantage is you don't get any money until release day, um, but it helps build audience and it helps build awareness. Um, you know, you so that so pre-orders can be really, really powerful. They can also suck down your sales potentially, because. 100 people or how many people already bought the book, so on the day it gets released, they're not going to be buying it. Um, it will be listed, but that's a whole other thing. Um, it also gives you a chance to offer your book at a discount so that they want to pick it up. So if you're charging, you know, $7.99 and your pre-order is $5.99, you're giving them an incentive to go early. One of the other reasons you want pre-orders is because you want to get reviews. We'll talk about that in a second. Your beta readers, okay? The beta readers are those who read your novel when you think it's ready to print. Uh, they may still find typos, and they do, uh, but hopefully there's a lot less. They can also be influencers. They can be the people who say, oh my God, I just read this book and you gotta get it. And those are your, they're your, your best friends. They are your super fans. You love these people too. Um, they try to make your book better. Again, going back to some of the other strategy books, um, uh, Mal and Jill Cooper's Help My Launch Plan Sucks talks about managing beta readers and what they can do for you. Okay, two more things needed. We talked about this. We're coming back. You've got the words, but you need two more things for a book, a cover, and a book description, also known as a blurb. And blurbs, as I said before, cover a lot of things. Uh, your book description, you know, Romeo and Juliet with chainsaws. A review from your, a reader, if you can get it, couldn't put it down. Something. You know, those are all helping because other people, uh-oh, 9 minutes, 52 seconds. Oh, my God, go faster. Ah! All righty. So we had this before. Covers are selling tools. The purpose of a cover is get you to pick up the book, turn it over, read the back cover burb, and buy the book. Or if you're on Amazon, look at the cover, learn a little bit more, maybe do, do one of the look insides or download a sample and buy the book. Here's some cover examples. Oh, also shameless plug. Uh, just so you know, uh, but there's some cover examples and they do different things, but I think mostly, certainly um, these two will tell you, will get you an idea that it's something to do with space. Um, this one, it's kind of like there's a steampunky girl here. Um, this one, eh, you don't know except that I cheat and I tell you it's LA, the first AI. Um, so, and I like the cover. I change covers a lot because I do my own covers. Not necessarily a good idea. All righty, covers, how do you get them? Build your own. Uh, the pros to that are you get what you want, and it's free, and you can easily replace covers. The cons, it's time consuming, and you better know what you want. Uh, you can buy a cover. Pros, you get a professional design. Cons, money. Uh, replacing a cover also costs more money. Or you can use something like Cover Creator or Canva, and you get help and some templates, and you can easily replace covers. Cons, doesn't always look professional. There's going to be a trade-off. Um, you know, if your pocketbook's tight, 
you do your best. If you're, you know, if you're Stephen King, somebody else works for him. Uh, so those are things to look at. Okay, book description example. This is a real book description example. It's wrong, um, and I'll explain why in a second. Okay, so New York Times best-selling author. It's for oh, it's not up on the screen anymore. What happens when the desires of a prince clash with the dreams of a Scottish lass? 1745, Edinburgh, Scotland. Bonnie Prince Charlie wants to restore his family to the throne. Downey Walker has a big dream, a steam walking machine, something tall enough to climb over small fences, straddle potholes, and keep moving for hours. If you love history, feisty women, and rebellion, you'll love the steam walker because it has it all and more. Read the steam walker today. Where, this is the old blurb. Unfortunately, I don't have an example of a new blurb up. You're gonna have to go to Amazon and probably buy it. <coughs> um, no, seriously, th this, You've got these, if you can download the PDF, I would recommend checking out what I've done with the new blurb because that's where I did the universal fantasies thing. Uh, and so we're talking more about, you know, her aspirations and hopes. And it's a little bit less plot-ish. This is not very plot-ish, but it's a little even less plot-ish and a little bit more like, wow, this is what's going to happen. This is where you're going. You know, uh, Danny does not want to marry the cruel, evil blacksmith. That's much more of an urban fantasy. You know, the marriage you don't want, looking for love. Anyway. All right, so the art of writing book descriptions, and this is really hard. You are going to spend a lot of your time learning how to do it. It's also different from the way that we, have, we as writers generally work. Um, there are great classes. We talked about some. Brian Cohen, Mark Dawson, Craig Martell, Brian Meeks, Mal and Drew Cooper, and Theodora Taylor. Um, and you're going to want to distill the essence of your book in such a way that it conveys a temptation to your potential readers, and the temptation is to buy the book. Uh, and my advice is read up on this art form or come to 20 bucks of 50K and learn everything you can. Same difference. All righty, blurb. Here's another blurb. Um, one of the things that we tell you, we all writers will tell you this, don't read your reviews. And yeah, they can be soul destroying and they can be written by people who really shouldn't be writing them. Um, but every now and then, uh, if you go through them, you get these marvelous ones like five out of five stars, good read, adventure with heart, and you can just put it in your, your product description or your blurb, you know, verified purchase, strong female characters, great story, could not put down, look forward to next book, awesome storytelling. Todd McCaffrey has a bright light in these days, I love that. But it, A, a, a review like that really helps my heart, um, but on the other hand, if you put it up there and you can, you know, put it in, to your, either your description or your back cover copy or something like that, people go, this is a validation thing. This is a, a reader read it, a real reader read it, and they liked it a lot. You know, so when you're looking at it, you're sitting there going, huh, okay. All right. The other place you can get blurbs is reviewers and fellow authors. Um, reviewers and fellow authors that can strengthen the value of the book. The other thing you want to remember, notice how he underlined that with his voice, whoever you're getting a review from is also getting feedback. They're get, it's like, oh, you know, if Stephen King reviewed my book, guys, that's really going to help my book because he's a big best-selling name author and all that. It may lose things a little bit because everybody thinks Stephen King horror. And if my book's not horror, that may hurt. But if you're just a regular old author like me, Todd McCaffrey, uh, you can turn around. If, if, if I get a review on the back of your cover, I give you a blurb, then it also says, this, you know, Todd McCaffrey likes this book, which means when you're looking for more books to read, you go, oh, hey, that Todd McCaffrey guy, he liked this book, and I like this book too. What's he write? So it goes both ways. And remember that if people are asking you to do blurbs, because it does go both ways. And when you do it, you give the author name and the byline of whatever what book they want, like DJ Butler, author of Witchy Eye, or the late, great, and amazing Mike Resnick, Hugo and Nebula award-winning author. Anyway, something to look for. Okay, you're published. Your beta readers loved it. They're telling your friends about the book, but no one's buying. Your book is, as I say, a lone voice in a howling storm of books. Gee. Um, so how do you get your book to readers? This is the marketing funnel. Now, if you have the 93-page version, there's a lot more in here. Um, this is sort of the world that, that we as writers don't normally want to look at. We're like, we write the book, everybody buys it, we're rich. Yeah. Um, you have a couple things going on here. In the funnel, the blue is all the way down to where somebody buys the book. Yay. But 
they may not even know about the genre, you know, especially when you're writing Chainsaw Massacre love stories, not a really big genre right now. So you may want to, you may need to alert them to the existence of the genre or to the existence of the series or the book. Um, you may want to get them interested, which is another level down. So awareness may be, awareness may be a Facebook ad. Uh, a Facebook ad is generally very far away from somebody buying the book. But you may want them to get to know who you as an author are and what sort of stuff you write. So you have awareness, you have interest, like, huh, that's kind of a neat idea. You have desire, huh, I want to read this book. This also helps in the pre-order area because people are sitting there going like, well, maybe I want to read this book. And then you get them action. They bought the book. You're not done. You are, do not make this mistake. Oh my God, 100,000 people bought my book. How many people are going to buy your next book? This is where you want to engage your readers. You want to build mailing lists. You want to support them, whatever is going on there. And you want to turn them into advocates. Having somebody grab somebody else by the lapels or wherever and say, you've got to read this book. Some of my best reading experiences come from somebody saying that to me. Oh my God, this is a great book. Um, I learned about The Hobbit when I was at a science fiction convention. Somebody says, you haven't heard about a Hobbit? In a hole in the ground, there lived a Hobbit. Da, da, da. And so this is really, really where things go. Then they're a fan and you want to keep them forever because they will buy every book of yours. Unless you, unless you abuse your fans, it's possible to do it. Um, but if you, and, and by abusing your fans, A, you write books that they don't want to read. B, you stop writing books. Um, C, you're rude, you know? And they don't really care that it's the greatest book since all time. You're just being, you know, you are not behaving well. Um, so that'll, that'll get them to go away. But it's hard. Once you've got a, a diehard fan, you have to work at getting rid of them. I don't recommend it, by the way. Um, Okay, so in the funnel, there are things I use in the funnel, and I'm still playing. I'm still learning. I don't know if this stuff works, but I use this thing called stencil, which allows me to quickly slap together things into a picture with text. Uh, and I use buffer, which is a scheduling thing. So I schedule posts into Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. So people, were, that's an awareness thing. People know me. Uh, interest. I am self-confessed terrible at newsletters. I want to get better. Um, but I do send newsletters out, and I use MailChimp and MailerLite sort of in two different worlds. And also this, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, for Desire, I'll do promos. Um, you can do a shelf-safe promo for a science fiction. You can do countdown deals. Um, for action, I use Amazon ads. Uh, maybe I should be doing more Facebook ads. For nurturing the newsletter, I'm also at places like Comic-Con, conventions. 20 books to 50K is still a convention, but I would not consider it a major source of new fans. Hopefully, you guys are going to go, oh my God, I love Todd McCaffrey, I got to read what he wrote. But it, we're in a different place. Um, ditto for advocacy, newsletter, Comic Con, conventions, and deals. Wow, I'm going fast. All righty. Oh my God, I went that fast. Wow, I'll have to go backwards. Um, so, in conclusion, write a good book, publish it, market it. Repeat 20 times to $50,000 a year or more. Repeat more than 20 times for even more money. Um, but that's kind of what we got to do. One of the big takeaways is if you're starting out and you write four books a year, that means five years before you're on that 20 books level. Uh, it may take more time, but it should give you an idea. This is, not, this is not an instant overnight success. Some people will do it. But generally, it's not, oh, I get to end. OK, all righty. So I'm, and can I do questions? Do I have any time for questions? Or are we done? Is it like, get out of here, Todd? It, you don't know when's the next panel? Uh-huh. Pardon? We're out? We're done, done. OK. Thank you so much, everyone. It was fun.